Thank you. So thanks very much for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. And I'm going to speak to you in English, and I hope you understand my accent in English. And I would not try and speak to you in French because my accent is even worse. And uh, this is really the topic of today's talk. Um, how maladaptive we are, how plastic we are in learning languages across the lifespan, and how our brains come to be organized for language. And despite the fact that it would be my best interest to sound more Canadian, uh, even to try and attract uh, uh, subjects for our, uh, our studies, because they always know it's my voice when I call on the phone, and sometimes say they're not there when I think that they are. Um, it, uh, it's a remarkably difficult thing to do to change um, aspects about what we've learned uh, later in life. So the topic of my talk is how our brains come to be organized for language when we learn at different points across the lifespan. And so this is Claude. Claude comes from Quebec. His mother is French and his father is English and Claude goes to school and studies in French. And this is James. He was born in England. His parents speak English. He lives in Quebec and is studying in French. This is Jenny. She was born in China. She speaks Mandarin and French. Jenny lives in Quebec and is studying in French. So all these three kids go to school in French and they all are high-functioning speakers of French, but in fact their brains are quite different uh, depending on the types of experiences they've had uh, uh, growing up. And so we expect them all to perform equally well on all types of language tasks despite the fact that their brains might have developed quite differently uh, because of their different language learning experiences. So I'm interested, I'm going to take you through three types of studies that we've done to try and address the question of how our brains are organized for language. Uh, the bulk of my work focuses on stuff we've done in Quebec looking. Quebec's a really nice place to capitalize on linguistic, uh, uh, the, the, how you learn languages come to be formed because you can look at people. Very rarely you find places where you get simultaneous bilingual, so people learning two languages from birth equally well. Uh, you get people who learn one language and then another later in life. You get people who learn to different levels of proficiency. So you can manipulate all these variables to look at how uh, our brain is impacted by these different scenarios. The second set of experiments are based on American Sign Language. And the thing that's interesting about this group that I work with, with Rachel Mabry, is that in the first scenario, people always learn a mother tongue and then another language. So they're always learning a language from birth. With people with American Sign Language, you get people who are born congenitally deaf who are late to learn a first language. So some of them, uh, um, because of sort of different scenarios like being born to hearing parents, it takes them a bit of time to work out what to do to get their kids set up. Um, they or they live in um, rural areas or outlying areas where there may not be opportunities. They come to learn their, their mother tongue later in life, and so you can see what happens in the brain in the absence of the development of a first language. And the third scenario that I'm going to focus on is work I did with Fred Genesee and his student Laura Pierce, looking at international adoptees. And they're interesting because here you get a different scenario, you get people who learn a first language within the year of life, abruptly lose that language, and learn a second first language. So what happens uh, when you have kind of essentially a second first language, but where it's different from what you actually learn within what's supposedly the critical period of life? So in all of these scenarios, the way that I do it is that we always look at the adults. We look at adults, but we look back at their development. So we look at what happened in their developmental history. So we're looking at the stable brain, but we're looking at what happened before uh, that might have impacted their brain organization. Um, and so I'm interested really in two kinds of scenarios. What happens when you learn a language from birth before sort of systems are set up? And what happens when you learn languages in the context of an already developed system where parts of the brain are already, already dedicated to different kinds of processing? Then I'm going to take you through a new sort of line of research we're doing. So this is Denise. She was born in South Africa. She's bilingual in English and Afrikaans, came to live in Montreal as an adult and has some difficulty with French and even sounds a bit strange in English. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, my daughter thinks that I'm lazy but I think that I don't have a good predisposition for learning language. So I started to become interested in the idea of neural biomarkers for predicting language learning success. So are there some people who uh, are better or, or have different 
patterns of connectivity in their brain which uh, might lead. So I'm going to, to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing on that. And all of the work I'm going to talk to you about is using brain imaging, so together with behavioral studies. I'm um, going to focus on uh, some of the studies are looking at language function, either with PET studies, which I did way back when I first came here, or functional MRI. Some new work we're doing with resting state MRI. We've done some cortical thickness studies, and we're also interested in diffusion tractography. So these are some of the tools that we're using to address these questions. And so, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I just went through that. Then I'm going to talk to you briefly about new challenges, new directions, and a few little words about applications of the work that one can do. So factors affecting uh, organization. So there are multiple factors that can affect how our brains come to be organized for languages, which are all important. Similarity of the languages that we learn, the environments that we learn them in. So, you know, the issues in the U.S. are different from the issues here. In the U.S., you have two languages which don't have equal status. Um, those kind of questions feed into it. SES gets factored into that. Um, so status of languages, time spent using a language, types of instruction. Um, it's a, a, to me, there's sort of a lot of interesting things about development versus adulthood, because in development, people maximize the kinds of instruction they give to children to develop the tools for learning language, whereas in adulthood, you're thrown into a room, things are said to you really quickly, you have to try and process it. And uh, if you look at, you know, a lot of the instruction for kids, it's where a, a, an instructor and the kid are working together towards uh, the interaction to develop the tools of the language, whereas in adulthood, mostly it's kind of instructing to someone instead of that kind of collaborative working environment. So all of those things can obviously influence the way we, we learn language. But I'm really focused a lot on the question of age of acquisition because I'm actually quite impressed with it. Lots of people think the bra brains are really plastic. I think that they are, but I think that there are um, things that happen really, really early in life, a lot earlier than we think that they do, that really have a lasting impact um, for years to come. And so I'm going to focus on that. And then, of course, different aspects of language might be differentially uh, impacted by age of acquisition. So not all aspects of language may fall into the same timelines. Um, so you may get away with some things later in life that uh, you can't get away with uh, uh, for other aspects of language. So I'm going to differentiate some of that. So we all know about sensitive periods for first language acquisition. So obviously, um, we, we, we learn really quickly in the first years of life, and that plateaus out, and most people sort of talk about critical periods being before the age of about five. Uh, there also are uh, critical periods or sensitive periods for the development of second languages. And I really like Patricia Kuhl's idea of the fact that in the beginning, babies are citizens of the world, and they turn their heads to the sounds of all languages, but really by the age of about six months, Babies are already only turning their heads to the sounds of the languages to which they've been exposed. So this idea of a very early sensitive period for phonology, which I will come back to later in some of the work uh, that we've been doing. So one thing that I was really struck by, uh, Alan Evans, who works at the MNI, has been doing these studies where he's been looking at brain development in babies. And this slide is interesting just to show you so in this side of the slide, what you can see is that by four years of age, the brain is kind of fully formed, and um, there uh, you can see sort of the process. So by four years of age, growth is, is, is maximal. But if you look here at the rate of growth, really, the brain grows really rapidly within the first three to six months of life and really plateaus out by a year, and not much happens even after that first year of life. So despite the fact that our brains are growing till about age four in terms of development, the rate of growth is really most rapid within those three to six months of life. And in the slide that he gave me, the asymmetries in the brain, so left-right asymmetries for regions that are important for language, like the left posterior superior temporal region uh, is also already, you can see this differential uh, in children by the age of three. Um, and Penfield, long time ago, said that man's mind has its own peculiar calendar. So he was really impressed with the idea about critical periods. Um, but we all sort of talk about questions about critical periods um, as sort of something that 
sort of ends at a particular period. I, I've been looking a little bit at, at when they start. And uh, so, you know, how early is the earliest critical period, not where, where, where the end point of them might be. Um, and mostly this is what we've been doing, getting a window into this using a functional brain imaging. So the first sets of studies that I did were a long time ago in the 90s when I first came to Montreal and brain imaging was just starting to be uh, developed and a lot of people were doing work on word generation. We couldn't do very sophisticated experiments because the techniques were quite crude. And uh, But uh, most people were asking about English and I just thought, well, um, what's happening when more than one language is organized in the brain. So the first set of studies were really just asking questions like, are the same brain regions involved for first and other languages? How are two languages represented in the brain? And so the first study we did was actually a PET scan, and we scanned 12 English-French uh, bilinguals. So their, their mother tongue was English, but they were highly proficient in French. They were right-handed. And we got them to do a word generation task. And what you can see, I mean, the main point of the slide is to show you, so these are what are called axial views of the brain, and the left is the left hemisphere, and you can see these strong peaks in the left frontal lobe whenever they were producing a synonym. And uh, you see strikingly similar patterns when they were doing it in their mother tongue, so strongly left lateralized, um, and towards the, the, so the frontal, this is the frontal lobe, so towards the frontal brain. I don't know if there's a pointer, but anyway, it's, it's okay, I can just show you. And if you subtracted the French from the English, that frontal lobe peak disappeared, showing that they were highly overlapping regions. At the time, I never made much of the peak in the L2 one, that's in the chordate, but since then there's a whole topic of literature on the role of the chordate in language switching um, that uh, a lot of people uh, are speaking about now. So we, we saw that pattern when people were doing tasks that were like English and French, but what about languages that are more distinct like English and Chinese? Would you see as similar patterns of activation? So the second study was to look at word generation, and this time we got people whose mother tongue was Chinese and their second language was English. These were students that came to McGill. Most of them started learning English even later, so the English-French bilinguals were learning French around about the age of five. Uh, subjects were learning them uh, later. And again, what you saw is a strikingly strong left frontal activity uh, lateralized to the left hemisphere whenever they were generating uh, words in, in, in their first or second language. And again, if you subtracted the two from each other, the frontal lobe peaks disappeared. Uh, and then Robert Zatori, together with Laura Petito, did a similar study where they looked at word generation in Quebec signers, so uh, Quebec Sign Language, American Sign Language, and then hearing volunteers. And even though it was done in the visual modality, again, what they saw is whenever people were um, generating words, strong activity in the left frontal lobe. And the, so this peak in the left frontal lobe for sort of search and retrieval, lexical search and retrieval, whenever people are uh, finding a word in their first or in their second language, uh, and irrespective of modality, the auditory modality that we were presenting them in, uh, or uh, visual and producing the response, uh, the same regions were being activated. So this seems like a general area that isn't that sensitive to age of acquisition. Um, that's kind of a general search and retrieval region um, in the first and the second language and doesn't seem to be an, um, really affected by age of acquisition, which isn't surprising since people can acquire vocabularies uh, in different languages to uh, quite a high degree uh, of success, irrespective of when you learn them. And so this is just to show you how strikingly similar they were. So this was from that first study with the English and French, just to show you. So in the left-hand column, we're generating synonyms. In the middle column, we're generating rhymes. So a synonym is like we cry, uh, beverage, drink. In the second one, they had to generate, so they were given a word like house, and they had to say mouse, tactical, practical, just something like that. And in the last condition, we were interested in whether within language searches were different from across language searches. So in the last condition, it's a translation. So they heard like house, and they had to say maison. So what was interesting about this is that for all the tasks, irrespective of whether the search was based on semantics, phonology, or an across-language search, that left frontal peak was activated.
But what was interesting about this condition, the translation condition, was that whenever the response was into their non-native language, they activated an additional region in the left basal ganglia. So you can see a region there in the left putamen that we saw. And this was kind of interesting because we saw it um, uh, even so when we subtract generating synonyms in their second language and we subtract out generating synonyms in the first, the frontal lobe peak disappears, but the peak in the left basal ganglia remains. So we saw this even when they were repeating words in their second language compared to repeating words in their first. This area that seemed to be related to the increased articulatory demands in producing the response in a non-native language. So what was different about that translation condition wasn't necessarily the across-language search, but the production of the response into the uh, articulating in the non-native language. So since then I did a, a voxel-based morphometry study with a different group of subjects with a student of mine, Jonathan Birkin, and um, he found that simultaneous bilinguals, people who learn their two languages from birth, had a higher gray matter density in the left basal ganglia than a sequential bilinguals. And what he also found is that in um, late bilinguals, the better their accent, the higher the gray matter density in the left basal ganglia. So this region seems to be sort of linked both to age of acquisition and to later acquisition, but with better production, increased gray matter density in the left basal ganglia. And there are conditions, so I don't know if any of you have heard of foreign accent syndrome, but this is a very rare quirky disorder um, where there are often lesions to the left basal ganglia where people develop um, a disorder where uh, they, their accent mimics a foreign accent. So it's not that they have a foreign accent, but the um, melody of their voice or the organs of articulation are, are not as fine-tuned to producing the response. So that it actually can be, people seem to be very distressed by this, when you could sort of think, well, you know, it's not the end of the world to sound Chinese if you're English-speaking. But I do think that there is uh, two things. This is um, something, these um, areas of the basal ganglia are really the first things to develop in the brain. Um, we, we, uh, they're part of our um, intrinsic kind of way that we identify things about ourselves. And I, what I thought was kind of interesting, if you look at interviews of people with foreign accent who seem to feel uh, very um, uh, unhappy with the fact that they've lost their ability to sound like themselves, uh, was something that struck me about the movie The Theory of Everything because Stephen Hawking's wife actually gets upset with him that he's agreeing to get a voice box that sounds American. And the Queen asked him when she met him uh, whether he still got that American voice. So people do really identify, and I think the reason that we find it so hard to change our accent is partly also to do with identity. And Stephen Hawking's... Uh, a, a long time ago, they were producing voice boxes that are British in accent, but he's kept his because this is his new identity. So I think that part of the resistance of uh, ability to change accent, one is its brain regions that develop very early in life um, and sort of are more the more automated sort of regions of the brain that are involved, uh, but the other is also that it's linked in some way to, to who we are. So we've also been looking at um, what happens to the organization of the brain from an anatomical point of view. So we've been using cortical thickness to look at language learning. So we took all these participants who'd been involved in our studies and we did a retrospective study and we looked at cortical thickness. So how thick the cortex is depending on their age of acquisition. So it wasn't sort of set, set up, it, it had its limitations because it wasn't set up as an experiment uh, in the first place. But what we did is, so we took 22 monolinguals and we took 68 bilinguals that we'd uh, looked at over time. We divided them into simultaneous learning before age three, early from four to seven years, and late after um, uh, age seven, um, between ages eight and 13, and they were all right-handed and matched for uh, chronological age and socioeconomic status. And what we did is we measured the gray-white gray boundary, so using a cortical thickness technique. And um, what you do is it's kind of a, quite an interesting thing because it's a whole brain analysis. So you have no preconceived ideas. You run this analysis across all these tiny vertices in the brain, and you see which areas are thicker or thinner in different groups. And you come up with areas of statistically significant difference in cortical thickness. So what we found in general 
is that bilinguals have thicker left frontal cortex than monolinguals. But the story is a little bit more complicated than that. So late bilinguals have a thicker cortex than monolinguals. Early bilinguals have a slightly thicker cortex than monolinguals. But actually, simultaneous bilinguals and monolinguals have no significant difference in cortical thickness. So kind of suggesting, so it's not to say that there aren't differences between learning two languages and learning one, but in my mind, it's like wiring a room. If you, if you wire a room from the beginning and you know exactly how you want to organize the room, you're going to make the, um, the holes to put the cables and all those things in one place, whether you're putting two cords in or whether you're putting in one. But if you make those holes and then later you want to add something and the hole isn't quite big enough, you're going to have to rig it up a slightly different way. So I think that this is what's showing that the brain kind of organizes for one or for two languages maximally if you learn it early. And that later in life you have to bulk up. And in our regression, that's what we showed, that the later the acquisition, the thicker the left frontal cortex. So uh, I'm going to sort of take a bit of a shift and, and in the end hopefully it will all come together, some of the thoughts to look at the other linguistic situations that I spoke to you about before. So this is to look at brain organization of the uh, delayed first language in the people with American Sign Language. Um, and this was originally behavioral work of Rachel Maybury where she found that people who learned sign language early looked like people who learned spoken language early. So there was no difference in their behavior when you learn sign early. But if you learn sign language late, you were delayed in grammatical um, processing. But she also found uh, other differences that uh, were of interest um, that I'll sort of relate to in, in a bit. So we took those same people and we divided them into native, early, and late. And we did a functional, the same grammaticality judgment study. And what we found is that those people who learned um, from zero to three uh, activated the left frontal cortex. So here you can see this is frontal, the blue, and this is occipital. And those who learned it early, a little bit less, but still activated it. And those who learned it late did not activate. They show a reverse pattern, they show greater activity in the left in the left occipital region. And what Rachel had uh, found with these people is that those people who learn sign late process uh, sign more sort of visually. They uh, Those who learn early make more kind of semantic errors when they're signing, whereas those who learn to sign late make more sort of orthographic kinds of errors. What she also found is that those people who learn sign language late have a lot of difficulty learning secondary language skills like learning to read and they also have a lot of difficulty learning second languages and what this work is kind of showing you what what you can see in the next slide we did a regression of all the 24 what we did is that the earlier they learned their, their mother tongue the more they activated that left frontal region and the later they learned it the more they activated the occipital cortex and it sort of clusters around the age of seven and i think that this is to do with what Penfield called the uncommitted cortex for language learning. And I think it's to do with the fact that um, at the beginning of life, when the brain's coming to be set up, that those parts of the brain that are meant to be for language, if we start using language early, kind of get wired in this way. This is why you see, you know, by three, month, uh, three years of age, we've already got these um, uh, differences between the hemispheres. In those individuals who learn sign language late, they do come to learn it, but they have to do it by a different route because those parts of the brain might become committed to other functions if they are not set up maximally from really uh, early in life. Um, and I'm going to sort of link this to um, what we've been doing with the work with international adoptees because what happened with the international adoptees, what struck me, is that they tell you uh, not when the end of the critical period ends, um, sort of like in Rachel's study where you sort of see that by age seven people, you know, who haven't learned it don't use these regions. This shows you really um, in quite an interesting way the earliest point in development the, where when language starts to have an impact on later organization of the brain because we know exactly when these children were adopted. So we know exactly when they stopped to learn their first language and learn to second first language. And so I think they offer really quite interesting insights into um, how our brains are set up for language. And so we have three different groups. We have, in the first group, we have children 
who are born um, in China, they learn Chinese, uh, they abruptly lose Chinese and they become monolingual French. We have a second group, they are monolingual French speakers, they're born speaking French and they continue to speak French. Then we have a third group who are Chinese children born in Quebec, they learn Chinese within the first months of life. And they continue to use their Chinese, but they also learn French at the same age as the international adoptees. So they have continuous use of two languages, and the other two groups are essentially monolingual French speakers. So we had two kinds of experiments that we did. The first was to look at what happened to the lost language, and the second was what happened to the new language. And so the first experiment was based on something I actually did a long time ago with Robert Satori, so probably 20 years ago, when we got uh, uh, native speakers of Chinese and non-native speakers of Chinese to process uh, stimuli <coughs> that were tone. And what you can do is you can hear, I want you to do this experiment. Tell me if these sound the same or different. Huh? Huh. What did you say? Different? Different? Oh. Sorry, it's hard to see. Oh. Can you hear the first one? Yeah, sorry, I think the wrong thing. Oh. Keeps on going, so I need to find it where. Chuan. 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 So the identical acoustic stimuli um, activate different parts of the brain depending on your experience with language. So the Mandarin speakers activate a whole lot of left hemisphere regions, whereas the non-native speakers of English process these like tones, uh, 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 sort of pitch discriminations, and they activate the right hemisphere only. So in this experiment with the children from China, we did a similar kind of experiment. We gave them... Uh, Chinese tones that they had to discriminate. And what we did is we uh, gave them first, so these are the Chinese French bilinguals. So they activate uh, bilaterally the superior temporal gyrus stronger on the left hemisphere than the right. So they're processing these Chinese tones linguistically. The monolinguals, so the native speakers of Quebec who don't speak any, they're just the French children, activate the right hemisphere only. So can you see that? And our question would be, what did the native speaker, what did the international adoptees look like? They are essentially monolingual French speakers. They're all between the ages of 10 to 17 years of age. So none of them have been speaking uh, Chinese since they came here for 10 to 12 years, and none have any conscious recollection of Chinese. But would they look more like the monolinguals, or would they retain traces of their language? And what they look like is they look like the bilinguals. So despite the fact that they have no conscious recollection, they are still processing these tones uh, lexically. And if you overlap the international adoptees and the bilinguals, they are strikingly similar regions. And the thing that's interesting about it is that if you um, factor in the months post-adoption, so you, you look to see, we, did, we looked at the relationship between age of adoption, so the longer, the later they were adopted from China, the more, longer they were exposed to Chinese, the more they activated the left planet temporarily. So there is a relationship with the amount of, of time spent learning those uh, tones, which are early sort of phonological representations that they get sort of in the first months of life. So we then wanted to, to see what happens when you know that they're still retaining these tones. What would their second language look like? Would it look like a, a, a monolingual speaker of French? Or would it still look like a bilingual person despite the fact that they don't speak more than one language? 
So what is the sort of scaffolding of the second language? Is it that they look like monolinguals or do they still look like bilinguals when they're using their, their language French? So we gave them a non-word task with French sort of phonological forms and it was a zero back, one back and two back task. So basically a phonological working memory task where we wanted to see uh, what would be the difference between uh, these, these three groups. So the monolinguals are the people who speak only French. They're the children born in Quebec, never speak anything else. On this task, they activate the left insula, this region that's thought to be important for language attainment. And then we look to see what the adoptees look like, because essentially they are monolingual French speakers, but their pattern looks quite different from the monolingual French speakers. And then we compared them to the bilinguals. And again, despite the fact that they're doing this task in the lang only language that they know, they're still processing these stimuli uh, like bilinguals. So I think this is kind of an important take-home message for the classroom, that we think that everybody's behaving the same because they, they, they present in a certain way, but they bring with them sort of the baggage that comes with what they've learned. And the brain thins and thicks and develops in different ways at different points in development. And one of the things I wanted to show you, so this is if we look at the monolingual compared to bilingual and monolingual compared to adoptee. What's different about the monolingual is they're recruiting more this left insular region. And if we look at the effect of cognitive load, so the two back minus baseline and the two back minus zero back is the effect of cognitive load. So the monolingual French don't, when they do this class, in order to all perform it, so they're all performing at the same level of functioning. But the L2 learners and the international adoptees are recruiting uh, to do this task to the same level of performance a whole <coughs> lot of additional regions that are involved in cognitive control. So you can see here that they're recruiting these additional regions that the monolingual French are not doing. And I think that this is important because in the classroom, some of these things may or may not develop at different points in development. So kids may look like they're behind at some points in development when in fact um, uh, the task may just require that of them at a certain point in time and then they may achieve this at a different point. The other thing that I wanted to focus on just because everybody focuses on it in, in bilingualism is the fact that being bilingual is good for you. <laughs> and um, Besides the fact that it's good to know more than one language because it gets you places, a lot of people have said that bilingualism sort of gives you advantages um, in all sorts of things like offsetting the onset of Alzheimer's disease and all of those things. And so one of the things that we've kind of been working on is the idea of are all, are all bilinguals equal because I think that they're not. And so we've been looking at these uh, behavioral tasks with some of the resting state connectivity that we've been doing. And one of the things that we found, uh, so this is the behavioral data on assignment task. And uh, for interference suppression, simultaneous bilinguals have better interference suppression than sequential bilinguals. So I think that this literature really needs to be refined when people start talking about bilingual advantages. I think that they probably are on some levels. We found that our simultaneous bilinguals also have better anti-correlation in their resting state networks than sequential bilinguals. I'm not sure that this necessarily means anything uh, you know, it's not, is it better or worse, it's just that it's different. I think that learning two languages in one way compared to another taxes the system in different kinds of ways. But I think that this conversation about bilingualism as being uh, something that is good for you needs to be uh, sort of more fine-grained than, than, than the way that it, and I definitely don't think that just lumping all bilinguals together compared to monolinguals is the way uh, to, to discuss the topic. Um, so, just to, to uh, progress to tell you that we've been looking at questions about learning and development, but I also mentioned to you and I, I emphasized the, you know, the difference between learning uh, when you set up the brain from birth. Uh, but we can learn languages even in adulthood. And so one of the things that I've been interested in is biomarkers for predicting learning success because we had the opportunity of studying people who have 12 weeks of intensive language training as adults. And so we studied people who underwent, so they were 
uh, native speakers of English who came to McGill and did intensive French language training for 12 weeks. So five days a week, three hours a day for 12 weeks. And we scanned them at the beginning, and we scanned them at the end. And I have to say, it's not that easy to compare scans pre and post, although that is how you would want to look at how the brain is changed by training. But one of the things that we discovered that was interesting to do is to look at the brain of time one and look at the behavioral change from time one to time two and to look at biomarkers in the brain for predicting success. One of the things that we found using resting state connectivity was that those individuals who have stronger connectivity between that left insular region that I've shown you before on the phonological working memory task, and I've shown you the left frontal lobe is important for language in lots of different ways. Those people who had stronger connectivity between that seed region in the left frontal lobe there and the left STG showed the most improvement in acquiring new vocabulary lexical. So when we uh, asked them to tell stories from time one to time two, a number of novel words produced, uh, those with stronger connectivity between those two regions showed the most improvement uh, in that respect. And a different group of individuals with stronger connectivity between the left visual word form area and a different part of the left ST, the superior temporal gyrus, showed incre increased reading ability. So it's not the same individuals who have strong connectivity. So there are some people who showed better uh, connectivity and different uh, patterns of improvement compared to others. And it's not the same ones. It's not the same individuals who are good at everything. So when we say that I'm more visual, I'm more auditory, I'm more probably there is some uh, biological <laughs> evidence that, it, uh, uh, that that's important. So we've been trying, this was with resting state connectivity. We've now looked at segmenting using DTI, diffusion tensor tractography. We found that those individuals with, uh, uh, with that those with a thicker uh, left long segment of their arcuate vesiculus also were the, uh, had better improvement on lexical success uh, on a number of words retrieved. But one of the things that we're finding is that this field needs to be refined. Um, so what we're trying to do is to find new ways of reconstructing pathways, relating function to anatomy. So this is stuff we're doing with Michael Petridis now. We're trying to become more sophisticated about the connectivity of the human brain, trying to be um, the, uh, work out better ways to look at connectivity between different regions. I think it's a really exciting field to try and look at biomarkers for uh, success even for ways of manipulating it afterwards. I read some interesting studies which actually show that um, the people at ceiling, if you, if you do sort of things like TDCS where you try and excite the brain to learn better, those people who are doing worse actually improve more than those people who, who are, are doing better. So there might be, uh, these are sort of interesting questions where the field could go in terms of uh, how we can promote learning success uh, for people who are struggling. And these are some of the fine-grained analyses we're trying to do. And then there are all these new ideas about hubs, how networks change with experience before and after learning. And so trying to connect behavior and the brain uh, are, are some of the new ways that we can do it. So I've been telling you that the brain thicks and thins at different ages and stages, that we learn language at different ages and stages. I think the challenge is really to understand what this thickening and thinning means in relation to behavior, um, and when is it optimal and when is it difficult, that's I suppose, and understanding this for different phases of development and for different aspects of language. Maybe not all aspects of language are affected together. And so really also then that means that we all have very individual brains and that probably sort of more individual approach to how we think about working with people might be necessary. Um, some of this, the work that we're doing in the lab is uh, we have a big bilingual brain initiative. We have a, a study looking at early and late musicians in bilingual, so looking to see uh, are the effects um, uh, on language learning, do, do you have advantages by being a musician as well or uh, early and late learning on learning foreign languages. We're doing more intensive language training studies. We're also looking at bilingualism and its effects on stuttering. Uh, and I just wanted to sort of take a tiny little leap just to talk to you about knowledge translation. Because 
when I started out with the first PET scans that I did, and we put, uh, we injected, <laughs> um, you know, isotope into into the body to ask these questions about first and second language learning. In a way, I felt kind of, you know, are these questions in basic science just about how languages are learned? Are they necessary, or you know, is this just for my own interest? And should we really be asking people to participate in experiments which maybe might not be that valuable to the world as a whole? But Unbeknown to me, I presented my results to the neurosurgeons just showing them the areas of the brain that were activated. And all of a sudden, I started getting a flood of patients coming to me for pre-surgical mapping to identify the brain regions that are involved uh, in processing. The other thing that I didn't realize is that people didn't even know uh, about more than one language. And so they started sending me their patients to ask, you know, this is a patient who had epilepsy. She was a translator. She was trilingual. Her career was an interpreter. Mm -hmm. She learned uh, actually Spanish and French from birth and English later in life. And they wanted to know she didn't want to have these, her language affected when she had her operation. And so it was actually an interesting question to see uh, would the same brain regions be active and would she have difficulty afterwards in any one of the languages. We also realized that people, you know, uh, who this was a patient who spoke in Nuktitut, and we realized that we could use a translation task because we had found that the same brain regions would be active even if they were doing a translation. So knowing that you can use these things, uh, sometimes we, we assume we can do these things, but they're, they're worth knowing. And since then we've scanned, we've now, have, have we used the same protocol that we developed for that bilingual study for over a thousand subjects who've gone on to have brain operations that would have been inoperable. Um, and uh, this to show you, activating, I showed you how we activated those regions. The synonym generation, so these are tumors where you activate the language regions and can show the surgeon how it's displaced or where it is. And they can use this, they can isolate the tumor and the area that's active for language, make a three dimensional image and look at it in relation to the vessels of the brain. And they can even plan the resection before the operation. So something that you didn't even think would have an application to something like pre-surgical mapping suddenly sort of opened up a new world that I never imagined. So I think that, you know, we do experiments to understand them, but we also really never know when they might have some implication we didn't expect. So I think that that's a nice sort of science story to it. And I think the same is emerging for the field of educational neuroscience, because I think that uh, in the past there wasn't good a uh, connection between people working in neuroscience and people working in education um, or in, in linguistics or in different fields because we didn't have the tools to bridge all our disciplines. But I think at last our tools are becoming uh, possible to, to sort of bridge these, these gaps. So if anybody has questions that they want to ask and they think that maybe they, they could um, have some sort of uh, translation or application to neuroscience. I'm happy to discuss the opportunities. Uh, these are sort of the, the kinds of questions we're asking, but of course, uh, um, happy to broaden the, the questions if anybody else wants that. And the CRBLM really is there also to bridge disciplines and to bridge people who've never thought that they would work together before. So uh, I hope that this might at least open up some opportunity for future collaborations. Thank you. Mm -hmm.